So, hi everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Porter. I'm a Toronto correspondent with the New York Times, but I am talking to you right now, if you're tuning in live, from Old Masset, an, uh, a village up in Haida Gwaii, which is an island, series of islands up on the northwest coast of Canada, just south of the Panhandle. And um, it is where totem poles basically were born. And I am um, I'm interviewing Christian White, who's going to tell you who he is. Good morning, Sangai Las. Kishkulan Tanudikyan, Ye Ohadal. Kayalas Kustu Dik Alagu. Good morning. Um, my name is, uh, means Golden Voice. Um, um, I'm a massive Haida from uh, I'm on the from the Raven side. I, um, yeah, so yeah, my, uh, so I'm carving on a pole here. Uh, this uh, red cedar pole will be uh, raised uh, June 21st uh, of this year. Uh, this log is uh, 62 feet long. Um, the pole will stand uh, uh, 51 feet above ground. Hold on, let me just show everybody. If you're tuning in right now, it's Catherine Porter. Here I am in Christian White's work shed where he's working on a 51 feet foot totem pole. You can see, I've just done a, a pan of it. You can see his workshop. Here we are. Christian, um, tell us about this pole. What What is a pole for? Well, uh, about uh, 1820, there was a pole raised out at a, a village called Shilin, uh, near a place we call Tow Hill now. And uh, it stood there for about a hundred years, and then um, it was removed and uh, uh, taken away to another uh, city uh, where it was raised, and it stood there for another 45 years. After it was uh, replaced and you know cut down and replaced. Um, it was sent back here, uh, and it's just been laying in a carving in a shed ever since. So it's 200 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. close to 200 years old. Uh, so I was uh, asked, to, I was commissioned to do this poll by our old Massive Village Council um, to be uh, raised at a new uh, a new site that they're developing at Tow Hill. Uh, but uh, this top part of the pole, I had to um, design um, myself. Uh, the lower part of the pole is uh, based on the old totem pole. Mm -hmm. And then uh, because this one is so much uh, taller, I designed these figures on the top here. Mm -hmm. On the very top is a figure called the Watchman. Let's walk over there a little bit, shall we? And the watchmen are always depicted li looking out in different directions. And uh, let's see if uh, if I move this hats, way, the very tall hats uh, uh, signifying the, the potlatches, and the chiefs. Uh huh. Which are like economic and social. Um, how would you describe a potlatch? A potlatch is our form of government, uh, the traditional form of government. Uh, it's uh, based on reciprocity, uh, paying back for work has, that has been done or for witnessing an event, okay. such as a totem pole or the building of a longhouse. Cool. And of course, uh, these poles have crest figures. This is the raven crest figure here with here. the moon. Let me just step back so people can see it. If you're just joining us now, I'm Catherine Porter. I'm here in Haida Gwaii, Old Masset with master carver Christian White, who's working on a totem pole that's going to be um, finished by June and erected. And it's based on a 200-year-old pole that was taken away. So he's telling us about this figure here. So this is a raven. Uh, we say Yash. Yash uh, means raven. Uh, raven was a cultural hero of ours and on the northwest coast here. Uh, well, the Haida stories that I were, was told uh, was about the raven um, flying around in darkness, flying around, bumping into things. The whole uh, whole world was in darkness. 
but he, he had heard uh, that there was a chief with all the light in the world and he made a plan to go and get that light from the chief. Cool. And, uh, so it's a very uh, long story, uh, but eventually he does uh, get the light. Uh, this part here uh, signifies uh, uh, the, the crescent moon. So it's uh, um, kind of a big circle uh, carved out. So then the beak is coming down here. Along each side are the raven's wings. The uh, Haida style of carving is uh, very massive uh, features. The eyes are carved very massively. Hmm. Uh, the beaks, uh, you know, uh, all the facial features are carved uh, very large. And and can you show us like you, what some of the tools you use? You, the tools are they similar to the tools that people would have used 200 years ago? Yeah, th this uh, this tool is uh, we just call it a skew. It's a chisel, and um, uh, we use this tool to smooth down uh, large areas. So um, I could take this skew and it kind of works like a plane. So when while we're talking and you're showing us this, um, uh, Kurt Monroe's asked if you're a Native American. What would your well, answer be to him? Well, uh, well I, I'm a First Nations from Canada. Uh -huh. uh, my father was Haida. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, I was born here on Haida Gwaii, and um, you know, uh, so uh, I've been a carver for, since around 1975, um, and uh, mainly carving in argillite, uh, and also silver, gold, and cedar. Mm -hmm. These are, this is a cedar, maybe you can keep showing us how you, you plane it down with your planer. This is, uh, Fazel's asking what this is. This is a totem pole, um, which is a, a Haida um, structure made out of cedar. This tree, how long do you, th how, how old do you think this tree was while you were, you know, that you're, you're, use you're um, cutting into right now? The cedar was approximately 600 years old. 600 years old, okay, wow. So, um, so it was, uh, you know, it's a western red cedar. Uh huh. Um, so this this was uh, found right near the center of our islands, um, not too far from the Yakun River. Okay. And uh, so uh, I well, went out into the forest to select the the tree and to uh, approve the the tree. Wow. And how how do you tell like it's a good tree for this? Look at I'm just going to show everyone if they're tuning in right now. It's Catherine Porter. I'm here with Master Carver Christian White. We are in Haida Gwaii, uh, in northwest coast of Canada, and um, in his shed where he is making a totem pole. Yes, uh, this um, my grandfather. Uh, he taught me how to select the cedar tree, and also my father. And. Uh, uh, the, the cedar, you have to find a tree that's very straight grained. Um, you, you preferably would look for a tree that is uh, very solid uh, on the top. A lot of the trees have uh, 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 no uh, foliage on the top, on the very tip, and that would signify rot in ah. the center. But as for a pole, it's not totally um, uh, needed to uh, fill all those uh, things. Uh, this pole actually had a slight twist a very slight twist to it. The tree did, or the pole? A, a, the top was not very solid. Okay. But uh, for this pole, I had to hollow out the center because it had center rot, and it was uh, the original pole was um, hollowed out also with fire and uh, probably uh, stone tools, and uh, so um, uh, so we could still uh, look at that old pole. What's left of the old pole? that's in storage and uh, we could see some of their methods of carving. Wow. And I brought my students there on several occasions to trace parts of the design and to uh, do uh, rubbings of the, some of the uh, elements of the design. And so, and to take measurements. Um, and I was able to transfer those to the lower part of the pole, the lower two thirds of the pole. And this upper section of the pole, I had to design myself, really. Because and, it's uh, longer than the original? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I see. So some of it is some of it is based on a 200 year old um, totem pole, and some of it is new that you've you've added that your yes. own design. Mm -hmm. Can you show us a few more of the tools? I'm, I have a, a okay. sense that maybe some readers so would be interested. Here, this here is an ads. Uh, the ads. Uh, uh, it's used uh, for very repetitive uh, motions, and uh, it can be uh, used to trim down. It can be very used very precisely. So this is a, a traditional tool. I have another. Well, keep going. I have another. Um, watchers asking again if you're Native American. No, he's a Canadian, Haida, from Haida Gwaii, which is an archipelago on the northwest coast of Canada, and. Um, uh, is just south of the Alaska um, handle. So th these are this this tool is like a really ancient. You, you don't use any power tools. This, do you, you use all hand tools to do this? Yeah. Well, uh, in this day and age, uh, when I first started the pole, I used uh, uh, power some power tools, uh, chainsaws, and other tools. Um, but uh, that was probably for the first uh, several. Uh, weeks. Uh, it took us actually t about a month and a half, even with the power tools, to prepare the log for carving. Wow. It took us a long time because we, we did use power tools for a little while, but we had to use hand tools for the most part to get it to the right shape and to hollow out the, the pole. Wow. So so how, how long will this whole process take? Well, the whole, a carving of a pole such as this takes about six months. And uh, we're at the stage right now where we're using all our hand tools uh, to carve the rest of the pole to shape. Uh, it's so much more enjoyable to carve the, the wood with hand tools. You know, you, you could hear, you know, you could hear the tools. Um, you could you could smell the the, the cedar and. Uh, uh, all the students that I have working for me, uh, they, uh, they're they getting to learn how to use the tools for the first time. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're in their early 20s. So it, you're going to have students, and how many of you take, like it's going to take to do this poll, and how many months well, did I, you say? I have two experienced carvers working with me, and uh, eight students. Mm -hmm. wow. and so uh, many of the eight students have uh, um, very limited experience. Um, and so uh, this is a you know something new for them. Cool. And uh, you know they can make up their mind whether they want to be artists uh, after this. Wonderful. So um, uh, again, my name is Catherine Porter. I am a journalist with the uh, New York Times, normally based in Toronto, but here I am in Haida Gwaii, in the northwest coast of Canada. If you're just um, joining us right now, I'm here with Master Carver Christian White, who's working on a totem pole. It's going up in June. He's showing us how he uses basically tools that are not that much different than what people would have used hundreds of years ago here. Can you tell us a little bit about the piece that, you know, the part that you're working on right now? Um, this, uh, this figure here is uh, a man uh, wearing an eagle skin. Okay. And uh, uh, it's a story that I've, I've learned uh, over the years. Uh, it's a story about uh, jealousy and treachery, I guess. And, uh, in the story, a young man uh, is set adrift by his uncle on a canoe. He's, uh, he's glued down to a board, a cedar board, which is set across a canoe, and he's set adrift. And he drifts for many days in the blistering sun, and uh, finally he, he could hear, he could feel the the canoe bumping up against the shore. He has drifted to the edge of the world. And uh, um, when he opens his eyes, he, he sees a, a leaning pole uh, with eagles sitting one above the other. And uh, uh, he closes his eyes again, and he opens his eyes, and then he sees two beautiful young women standing above him. And they, uh, uh, release them from uh, the board and take them back to their village. And it's an eagle village. He has drifted to the edge of the world where the sun, where, where the sky meets the, the sea. 
And uh, so he's taken in and uh, nursed back to health. And uh, after a while, the chief uh, gives, goes and asks for a box. And they, they bring out a box. And the box, uh, inside the box is a eagle skin, uh, the skin of a young eagle. And uh, they, he puts it on. And as he goes to, towards the door, he sees all the other eagle people putting on their skins. And as they go out the door, they transform into eagles. So, wow. Uh, they're, uh, and so they teach him how to hunt uh, for different sea creatures. And uh, uh, so he goes along and uh, learns how to hunt different kinds of salmon, porpoises, and then even whales eventually. Uh, they warn him against uh, going uh, to, to this creature that sticks its head out of the water. Uh, this creature is a, a giant clam with the head of a sea lion. And so as it sticks its head out, he dives down and tries to, to capture it. And, uh, but he's dragged beneath the water. Another eagle flies over and grabs him by his shoulders and tries to fly out, but that eagle too is drawn below. And it goes on and on until the whole village of eagles is below the water. Oh, wow. Finally, the old uh, uh, grandmother of the eagles flies out and she grabs the last eagle going below the surface. And with her strength, the, uh, the, the nani, the, uh, the grandmother, is able to bring the eagle, all eagles, back out. Um, he recovers again and he goes to look where his uncle that has set him adrift, he goes there to destroy his uncle. And he flies uh, to the human's village again as in, in his eagle form and he grabs onto the uh, chief by the top knot of his hair. Um, the, uh, one of the chief's uh, uh, nephews uh, grabs onto his ankles and then another one, then another one, and pretty soon there's a string of the, the human beings. Uh, all of uh, the enemies of the young man are hanging onto each other and he flies over the sea and then he drops them into the sea. Uh, he eventually uh, comes back to his uh, village and uh, uh, takes off his eagle skin and then um, he becomes a human once again and he's able to take the place of his uncle. Wow. And, uh, uh, and then ever since uh, the eagle side has had uh, his oppressed. Uh-huh. What an elaborate story too. But if you were Haida, would you know that story looking at this? Would it be something that you grew up with? Yes. Well, uh, we, we do this story uh, in our performances also, and uh, um, so we act out uh, some of the story, parts of the story, along with song. So we, we create all the masks and characters for the story. We use the eagle wings, right. the eagle uh, whistles. I and saw some of your masks that you created we, here. Yeah, we sing the song uh, accompanied by uh, drums. Actually, yeah, we sing a couple of different songs that belong to the eagle side. I've had some people, Heather Boaz Malloy is asking about, you know, First Nations here, particularly the Haida, and um, uh, your, your status in terms of legal status. I think she's asking about um, uh, your, your land title right, um, title lawsuit that you're taking the government for title to all the land here. Well, yeah, the, um, yeah, well, our people are pursuing that. Um, we have been left with nothing for the last um, 150 years. Um, even a few years ago, it was very difficult just to even get a cedar log. And uh, while well, we've seen three barge loads a week going past our village, um, I've seen that all through my whole lifetime. Uh, billions of dollars worth of timber coming off our islands and our people have received very little benefit uh, so uh, I think it's about time that we had our, our rights uh, acknowledged the fact that we have never our title for these lands have never been taken from us never been extinguished there's never been a treaty here yeah. 
You know, I was speaking to the um, president of the Council of Haida Nation. He was saying he's in court today with depositions on that case. If you're just joining us now, I'm Catherine Porter. I'm with the New York Times, normally based in Toronto, but right now um, I'm here in Old Masset Village, Haida Gwaii, with Master Carver Christian White, who's working on a, a totem pole. We have a few more minutes before we're going to sign off. If you have any questions, now's the time to send them to, 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 to me, and I will ask Christian while we're here. You must feel... Um, um, uh, very, I guess it's sort of a communion with people in the past doing the same, same t figures on a totem pole that was carved so long ago, um, like 200 years ago with the same kind of tools. Do you feel, um, like, is there some kind of spiritual communion you, you have while you're doing this? Yes, I believe uh, that our, the crests on here, the, the totem poles, they connect us with the land. Uh, at one time, uh, there was over a hundred villages and camps on our island, surrounding every bit, every corner, every bay of our islands. And uh, now we mostly live in two communities. But over the, over the next few years, we're going to start to expand back out to, to our, our old villages again. So we'll, we're going to reconnect with the land. Someone was asking, Marlies Appleton's asking you where you teach. Well, uh, this uh, carving shed, my father built it back in uh, the mid 80s. And uh, I was already an artist for 10 years by the time he built this here. And uh, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a traditional method, really. It's a, all my apprentices have been either uh, relations of mine, you know, uh, uh, sons of um, uh, cousins, uh, and uh, so, and uh, now there's actually uh, some of uh, my nieces are, and other young women are, are becoming artists too, so. Are they working on totem poles still so? Yeah, they're, they're actually yeah, working with me too. Oh, that's I have cool. four uh, youth, uh, uh, four female, four male. Excellent. And um, Wendy Hardy Karpinski is asking, what kind of wood is preferred for a totem? Uh, Western red cedar. The wood is very uh, uh, rot resistant, and it's a very, it's got a very firm quality. It's soft at the same time, but it's a very firm quality. Uh, we call it chu, chu. Chu. It's a uh, red cedar in the language. And Monica Wickler is asking about the ceremony you'll have when you raise this pole. Yes, uh, well, it'll, the totem pole will be raised by probably 400 people or so. There'll be several uh, lines um, uh, tied to the pole right around this point. Uh, but uh, there will be ceremony, of course. Uh, when we put the pole in, in place, uh, we will have a, um, the carver's dance. Uh, the carvers, all the youth, all my my journeymen carvers that are working with me, uh, uh, my brother and my uh, my son, uh, they're the most experienced carvers working here with me. And uh, there will be, uh, uh, we'll do the carvers dance. So we'll dance with our, our tools around the pole. And uh, uh, after that, um, there'll be uh, several women um, that uh, that will be a part of the ceremony to cleanse the pole. Uh, we do that with uh, cedar boughs and um, you know prayer and song. And uh, after that, then the men uh, or all the people will get to work in rigging up the pole for the raising. And it'll take about a, a ton of uh, stone or more to uh, put around the base of the pole. It'll go into the ground about uh, four meters or so into the ground, uh, you know, about 12 feet or so. Do you dig a giant hole there? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, sometimes we offer things into the, uh, the hole. Uh, like at a pole raising in Vancouver recently, there was, uh, we offered agates uh, from our beaches here. We took 
from, uh, from the North Beach here on Haida Gwaii. We took agates, stones, uh, shiny stones, and we, we put them into the, the hole that the pole was going to be raised in. And uh, so those are other little offerings, uh, sometimes beads, eagle down, uh, things like that. Wonderful. Yeah. And did you get dressed in traditional regalia for that? Yeah, yeah. We'll have, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah there's been a big revival of uh, making the traditional regalia. Uh, the weavers um, and uh, other uh, sewers, applique sewers, uh, weaving the, uh, the red cedar bark into hats, into headbands. Wow. And also spruce root, uh, uh, so many different materials uh, woven and sewn together wow. into regalia. I have so many questions here from readers. Timothy's asking if you have any sp special natural ways to treat cedar slivers. Um, oh, in your hands. That's yeah. a, that's yeah, a fun well, uh, question. Uh, well, we do have w uh, ways to treat uh, uh, cuts. Um, do you have any in your hands? Uh, um, no. 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 Uh, no. Uh, your hands are, are nice and healthy. So working them in hands. Uh, well, we use uh, spruce pitch actually as a, our antiseptic, and uh, for uh, any cuts. Uh, and it, um, my grandfather he taught us how to use that. Um, so it, it, this time of year is actually when we gather uh, spruce pitch. I have another. Uh, I have another reader uh, watcher who's asking about how you choose design. So um, you, earlier you said that some of this design is based on the pole that was um, built in 1820, but yes. the other ones that you that you've added, how do you choose? Is it a collective mm -hmm. process? Well, uh, this, this was uh, an interesting thing. Also, um, uh, my great great grandfather, his name was Charles Edenshaw. And uh, he was a well-known uh, artist. Uh, um, you know, uh, I think he was born around 1840, and uh, he died 1920. And he was an artist throughout his life. And he carved a model of the original pole. He carved the story on the pole, but the figures weren't the same as quite weren't, weren't quite the same arrangement and weren't the same style of the carving of the pole, the original pole. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when I looked at the old pole, and then I looked at his model of the story, and then I, I used that model as to, as an inspiration to design this top part. So I, I changed. Um, I changed. Actually, I changed his, on on his model. He had a the, a raven on the top, and then a watchman figure, and then an eagle. So I just rearranged them a little bit. But it's your own deci yeah. decision. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not um, a collective process. You, you yeah. as a master carver, chooses. Yeah. Also, one other question is that many of these, um, uh, many of these are family crests traditionally, right? You would put a, a clan crest or family crest on your totem poles. I think that many people believe that you could read a totem pole; it's all stories, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, on most uh, house frontal poles. Uh, it would depict the crests of the um, the chief of the household and his wife. So right. it would be both the eagle and raven, or raven and eagle crests. Uh, depends on what uh, what uh, crests of the owners of the household were. Uh huh. So uh, for each house, there was a house chief, and uh -huh. probably about forty occupants. Uh huh. These houses were quite large, really, uh, maybe fifty feet square. And um, they would have little compartments uh, made of um, just box, you know, boxes, piles of boxes, or also, uh, you know, planks of wood uh, would separate off little areas. But they would have a central fire where they would do all the cooking and uh, gathering. Uh, you know, I mean, and working on their nighttime projects. Uh -huh. So, uh, so the crests, you know, they were heraldic crests, really. They weren't. Um, uh, and th but they had stories that go along with each of these crests, like that. How they got the crests in the first place uh -huh. were, were the stories. And uh, Renee Russell Miller is asking if you, if um, first in Canada we call them First Nations, if the Haida dislike it when non-Haida people make totem poles. Yeah. Well, I, I probably, uh, you know, there's many different people that carve uh, poles. Uh, other cultures beside the Haida too, uh, you know, there's other, there's the uh, Shimshan, Nishka, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bella, Bella, I 
the, the, they're called the Hiltzik, the Kwakwak, Kiwak. So all, all along the whole coast here, Tlingit up in Alaska. Uh, so there's many of our cultures that we carve the, the poles here. And, uh, um, but uh, for us, it has a lot of meaning um, because it shows who we are and it shows where we come from. And uh, um, I think when other people uh, you know, uh, take up uh, uh, total pole carving, uh, when they don't have the bloodlines, um, I think it doesn't really have as much meaning, I think. Uh, so I'm not, uh, not, I'm not trying to discourage art, but uh, this is our art form, mm -hmm. our, our people's art form. Yeah. I'm Catherine Porter. Here I am in Haida Gwaii with Master Carver Christian White. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you very much for watching. One last thing we're going to do is just take you on a little tour so you can see the pole, which will be 51 feet tall out of the ground when it's finished, Christian was just telling us. So here you can see it. I'm trying to turn around because our... our um, Let's see if we can go. I, I'm, I, the, I know our connection's not great, so I'm a little worried that if I walk too much, you won't be able to see it all. But here you can kind of get a sense of the different figures that he's, he and his apprentices and journeymen are, are another measuring tool. to measure that it's even on both sides. It's like a giant protractor. Thank you very much for joining us here. Again, I'm Catherine Porter. This is Christian White. Christian, thank you so much for taking us in the New York Times on a tour of your, of your shed and telling us about your work. We really appreciate it.